I invite you to take a Bible if you don't have one already and open to the Gospel of John chapter 13. John chapter 13 is where we will be here in just a moment. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have come together to worship our God, to praise Him, praise Him as we have just sung for who He is, for what He has done, and for all of the many blessings that He continues to give to each one of us in our lives. As we were reading in the back adult classroom this morning from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus reminds us there about loving our enemies and tells us that we need to do that so that we can be sons of our Father who is in heaven and reminds us that our great heavenly Father is the Father of us all, that He sends the sun and the rain on the just and the unjust, and we certainly are undeserving of all of those blessings, but we come together today to lift up His name, to glorify Him uh, for who He is. John chapter 13, I want us to begin our lesson this morning by reading a section of this text, verse 1 beginning down through verse 17. John 13 and verse 1, John says to us, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that His hour, uh, his hour had come, that He would depart out of this world, to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper and laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. In the previous chapter, John chapter 12, Jesus has entered into the city of Jerusalem. He has come into the city, you might remember, with great fanfare. He has come riding on the coal, the foal of a donkey. He has come with the people spreading the palm branches in the streets and shouting, Hosanna. But as this chapter opens, all of that crowd, I'm not saying to you, has left Jerusalem, but Jesus maybe has left that particular crowd because as chapter 13 opens, he is just meeting with the twelve. And he is meeting with them to prepare them for some coming events. He knows what is shortly to come. As John chapter 13 opens, it's just a matter of a few hours before he will be uh, arrested and tried and crucified. And he is preparing them even for the time when he would arise from the grave and he would go back to his father as John makes the comment to us here at verse 3 that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. Jesus, I'm sure, was anticipating that time when he and his father could truly be together again. And as you know, as he's preparing them for those coming events, he is giving the twelve some instructions about their mission before He is gone, that is chapters 13 through 16 of this gospel. And since that is the situation as John 13 begins, we might think it logical for Jesus to maybe perform even some greater miracle than he had already performed just for 
the apostles to see. We might think that he would give them some spectacular sign that would leave absolutely no doubt in their mind that he is who he has been claiming to be for these number of years, that he truly is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And yet he chose to use these last moments to teach the twelve about the importance of serving by showing them, not just telling them, but showing them that he himself is a servant. As we continue our congregational theme that we are going through this year of being more like Jesus, we're going to do so this morning by reflecting on what we just read here in John chapter 13 to see how God can make me and you, each one of us, a servant like our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. To help us do that, to go back and think about this text in a little bit more Detail Verses 1 through 5, I think John is really setting the scene for us here of everything else that happens not only in this chapter, but as I've suggested to you, all the way to the cross and even to the end when he ascends back to his Father. As this chapter opens, John tells us here at verse 1 that Jesus knew that his hour had come. As you read through the Gospels, and especially through the Gospel of John, you find instances where Jesus may be teaching in a very public way. Maybe he's teaching in the temple. Maybe he's teaching in the synagogue. Maybe he's teaching out in a a remote area, but there are hundreds or thousands, a great multitude that has come to listen to him. And oftentimes as his ministry, of course, goes on, uh, he remains popular, I think, for the most part with the, the multitudes, the masses. But the religious leaders begin to hear him, to observe him, to see the miracles that he has performed. And for the most part, their hearts begin to get harder and harder and harder. The opposition begins to grow more and more and more against Jesus. And there are times when they want to do away with him. But maybe the text says something like he slips out of their midst. He slips away from them. Something happens on those occasions where many times the gospel writers would tell us that his time had not yet come. And yet now we are at John 13 and John says Jesus knows now that his hour had come. You can look at these few verses in the previous chapter as Jesus talks about that particular thing. You know, if we could put ourselves as much as as possible in the shoes of Jesus right now and think about how we would react and what we would do and how we would spend our last few moments on earth, if we knew that our earthly life would soon end, if we knew that we would experience the type of death that our brother Lance has talked to us about this morning, the type of death that Jesus did being crucified on the cross, would we not, maybe many of us, want to withdraw (laughs) As Jesus often did, that he got away from the crowds. He wanted to have time alone with his Father to talk to his Father in prayer. Would we not maybe be in that mindset that we want to get away from everyone, even those who are very close to us? And yet Jesus, we see here as John 13 opens, did the exact opposite. Here he was spending time with those men that he had hand-chosen to be his messengers of the good news of salvation in him to the rest of the world. It was out of his love, his great love, as John also tells us at the end of verse 1, that he, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Out of the love that he had for his disciples, he gathers them together on this occasion to eat the Passover supper with them. And while he is eating that feast, of course, we know, as we've just read here, as many of us probably read many times, (laughs) that he removes his outer garment that he puts a towel around his waist, that he stoops down to the floor, he takes this pitcher of water or whatever container it is in, and he pours that water into a basin. And while he is there on on the floor, he is wiping the feet of those who are his followers. I want you to be impressed with the fact, even though we don't know exactly what Jesus looked like, (laughs) what we don't know, maybe we can't get a an exact picture in our mind of what is going on here. But I want you to be impressed with the fact, as John is relating this to us and telling us what is going on here, that Jesus is dressed like a servant. That This towel, as I understand it, was kind of a coarse cloth that servants often wore. He looks like a servant on the outside to them, but more than that, he is acting like a servant. He is taking this water and pouring it into a basin and washing the dirty, dusty feet of his disciples, something that only servants or slaves did. Can you imagine from the apostles' viewpoint, 
Can you imagine what kind of thoughts are going through their mind at this particular point? They have been following this man who has claimed to be the Messiah of God, God in the flesh, for about three, three and a half years at this particular point. They have heard many great sermons, I'm sure, like the Sermon on the Mount. They, they have seen many wonderful miracles that, of course, they couldn't explain any other way than He is God. Can you imagine what is going through their minds? They may be thinking to himself, what is he doing? I, I thought he was deity, and why would deity stoop down as he is to serve mere mortals, and especially in this particular way? Of course, in the day and age in which we live, the idea of foot washing is kind of lost on us, I think. But foot washing, Foot, foot washing was very much a sign of hospitality. It was a sign of humility. It was a sign of service. It was a sign of sacrifice. But it was also very much a necessary service for that day and that time, something that I ran across uh, in, in preparing this particular lesson. And I know it has to be right because it is from the Holman Bible Dictionary, okay? <laughs> uh, by the way, I haven't gotten the first... Uh, royalty check from that yet. It must be a different side of the family, I don't know. But here are just a few things that, that it says about foot washing. It says this is an act that is necessary uh, for the cleanliness uh, of those who have traveled a long ways during the Palestinian roads uh, with feet that would be shod or shorn in uh, sand and dirt. It was something that only a servant would do. It was something that was very common for them, something that is oftentimes lost on us today. It also went on to say it is a sign of exceptional love. A disciple might wash a master's feet or a wife might uh, wash her husband's feet. Something that even in this particular day and time uh, would have been seen as something that for many people would have been beneath them. And it's interesting to me, out of, out of all the ways in which Jesus could have taught his disciples about service, he chose this very humbling and in many cases humiliating act of service to teach them. And so that sets the scene for us of what's going on here in John chapter 13. But then, of course, we have Peter's response given to us beginning at verse 6, as we've already read, down through verse 11. As was often the case as we read through the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples, the twelve apostles, it was Peter who was apt to speak up first, and he did on this occasion. And he asked Jesus, why, why is he doing, I think, such a menial job? At least that's the way I read his comment here at verse 6, he came, it says, Jesus came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? At least in my mind, and there are a lot of occasions like this that I wish we couldn't just read what Jesus said, but we could hear it. We could have a video of, what, uh, uh, of the scene there and we could see it and it could appeal to all of our senses. But the way I think about Peter's response is, Lord, do you, do you wash my feet? You are the master and I am the servant. Do you wash my feet? And Jesus replied to that question there in verse 7 by saying to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. Jesus replied, I think, that he is doing much more than just merely washing their dirty, dusty feet. He is teaching them a spiritual truth. He is showing them what it looks like to be a servant. And yet it seems to me, again, maybe I'm reading more into this than I should, but it seems, given Peter's response there at verse 8, never shall you wash my feet, that maybe G Peter again seems kind of stunned that his Lord and his Master would stoop so low as to perform such a task as this. And sometimes I think we're very hard on Peter. But if we could put ourselves in this same situation, we need to honestly ask ourselves, would we have responded any better, better than this? <laughs> How 
However, Jesus told Peter that if he did not let him serve him, that he had no part with him. Peter, again, doesn't understand all of this, it seems to me. When you come to verse 9, again, he says, Lord, then wash not only my hand, my feet, but also my hands and my head. But Jesus, in essence, says to him at the last two verses of this, this section, verses 10 and 11, that this is about something greater than physical cleanliness and washing feet. This is about you becoming a servant, just like I am. And then, I believe, John describes for us the master servant himself, Jesus Christ, when we come to the last section that we'll look at at least this morning in verses 12 through 17. Jesus, of course, finishes washing their feet. He puts his outer garment back on. He joins the disciples now in reclining as they are eating the feast. I think at this particular point, he is now ready to give them the lesson of the day and give them the significance of what he had done to them. He was, as they rightly said, as he said that they were right in saying it, verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. He truly was their teacher. He was their rabbi. He was their Lord. He was their master. And yet, here is the profound thing about what has gone on to this point in John 13. He, their Lord, their teacher, their master, their rabbi, he became their servant to teach them, to show them the importance of serving one another. Think of this, again, going back to the very beginning of John chapter 13, as as John is describing for us and setting the scene here in the early verses. At verse 3, here is the one who had come forth from God. Here is the one who was going back to God. And he was making himself what I would describe as a true PowerPoint. (laughs) We we have the advantage today of having technology that we can, can show people our lessons, those of us who preach and teach, and we can connect with people in a visual way, but here is Jesus, I think, making himself a true PowerPoint for his apostles to clearly see they could not miss it. Here is the creator serving the creation. Here is the teacher serving the students. Here is the Lord serving the subjects. And what a deep, lasting impression this surely made upon these men that he has chosen after he has left this earth and gone back to his Father to take the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ to all the world. You see, the whole point of Jesus, what Jesus had done here, was to show his apostles that no one, absolutely no one, is too great to serve, and that they must become servants to one another. Yes, in this group of the twelve, which would soon quickly become the eleven, but not just to let their service stop there to one another, but that they might serve others as well. I want us to go back to the passage that our brother Todd read for us at the beginning of our assembly this morning in Luke's words, in Luke chapter 22, as he records these words of Jesus. Luke 22, uh, beginning at verse 24. Luke says, And there arose a dispute among them, among the twelve, as to which of them was regarded to be greatest, And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way with you, but the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines? But I am among you as the one who serves. Notice uh, Luke tells us on this occasion, as I think if I'm reading the Gospels right, It wasn't just this one occasion that the the apostles are arguing amongst themselves who's the greatest in the kingdom. (laughs) This seems to be kind of a running conversation with them. And and in the context of that, Jesus says, that's not the issue, really. (laughs) That's not what you ought to be concerned about. But if you really want to know who is the greatest in my kingdom, here's the answer, the one who is the servant the one who is the least among you, the one who considers himself to be the youngest, he is the greatest. The words of Jesus even about himself in Matthew chapter 20 at verse 28, as Jesus again had this conversation, whether it's the same conversation or at a different time, but Jesus said there, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
In this one act of watching the disciples' feet here in John chapter 13, Jesus is powerfully showing them, but He's also powerfully showing us who He truly is, why He truly came to earth, that He came to serve. Yes, He came to do the Father's will, as we talked about the first sermon in this series back in January. But in doing that, He came to be a servant. And then, as this at least the portion of the conversation that we are considering this morning, closes back in John 13 and verse 17. Here is really, I think, the most important thing of the whole conversation at verse 17. He says, if you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. If you know, you have to have knowledge, but it's not enough just to know these things that I'm trying to teach you here but you need to go out and do them. You need to go out and live them. You need to go out and be a servant just like I have shown you. Well, there's lots of applications that we can make this morning from this great text here in John 13. But as Jesus said several times, as we have already read, in in the kingdoms of men, here in that passage in Luke 22 and in, in Matthew chapter 20 and in Mark chapter 10, That in the kingdoms of men, the greatest is the one who can, quote, lord it over people. It's the one who can dominate or domineer people. It's the one who can, quote, exercise authority over them. It's the one who expects those whom they are, quote, over to serve them. You see, in the kingdoms of men, the greatest person among the kingdoms of men is the one who is really selfish, the one who is self-centered, the one who wants everyone else to serve them, and they're going to benefit on the backs of everyone else rather than serving their subjects. But Jesus made it very clear in those passages to his disciples and to us that is not so in his kingdom because in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the greatest, he says, is the one who serves like he serves. It is the one who removes his outer garments and girds himself with a towel and stoops down on the floor and washes the feet of those who are his followers. You see, the greatest in the kingdom of Christ is the one who lays aside his life. It is the one who takes the appearance and the position of a servant. It is the one who, like Jesus here in John 13 and on so many other occasions, does the work of a servant for his fellow human beings. There are lots of passages that we could consider this morning for the sake of time. I've just chosen two from Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 beginning at verse 13. Notice the words of Paul here to his fellow brethren. He says, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Paul is making the point here in this chapter that, yes, we have freedom in Christ. Yes, he has freed us from the slavery of sin. We are free. We have liberty in Christ. But he says, don't, don't use that freedom in the wrong way. Don't use that freedom just to serve yourself or to expect others to serve you. Certainly don't use that freedom to bite and devour one another with our attitudes, our actions, and our words. But he says, rather than doing those things, we must be like Jesus. And we must use the freedom that we have in Him to love other people, to serve other people. That now we are free, in a very real sense, to not serve the flesh, but through love to serve one another in the body of Christ and our world. John, the one who wrote the words that we're thinking about this morning in John chapter 13, also said this in his first epistle in 1 John chapter 3, 1 John 3, beginning at verse 16. He says, We know love by this, that he, Christ, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. For whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. 
If we had more time, we could back up a number of verses, even back to about verse 9 and 10. And John telling us, even at the very beginning of this chapter, you know, here is the one who is born of God. Here is the one who is a true child of God. And one way we know that is if we love as God loves us. Jesus, though, I want you to be impressed with the fact Jesus defined love. Jesus defined service for us. Jesus showed us, like he is showing his disciples in John 13, he defined love and service for us by laying down his life for us in the words that Matthew records, as we just read in Matthew 20 and verse 28, he gave his life a ransom for many. And so if we are to be like him, we must lay down our lives for others, and we do that by serving one another. Yes, it may be the case, and maybe this is what John has in mind given the circumstances uh, in which many first, first century Christians found themselves, that it might literally come to the point for even them that they might have to literally lay down their life just as Jesus laid down his life on the cross for a brother or sister in Christ. And that might be us, brothers and sisters, at some point in our our nation's history, if we keep going further and further away from God. And I don't know about you, none of us have faced that situation, I assume, but I don't know about you, I I think to myself, and I could be totally wrong, but I think if I were in that situation and had to choose to lay down my life so that my brother or sister could live, that I would do that. Because I know it wouldn't last very long. But I tell you what is much harder for me and I think for many of us is to live our lives with that attitude of laying down our life for our brother and sister in Christ. By serving them. By getting down on our hands and knees as it were and washing their feet. Some practical ways that we can serve like Jesus. This list is just, I mean, it's almost unending. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a big act of service as we categorize acts of service sometimes. It can be a cup of cold water in His name. We can certainly be like Jesus and we see all throughout His his life as as it's recorded for us in the Gospels that He served those He created by teaching them the good news about Himself. And that is, I believe, the greatest way that we can serve those around us that we can serve one another is to remind ourselves of who Jesus is, but to also take the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are outsiders, going along with Gavin's lesson at the 9 o'clock session this morning, that the gospel truly is for all. And Jesus shared the good news about himself with everybody who would listen. And we can serve like Jesus in that way. We need to be looking for opportunities and using opportunities to do that. We can help one another in the body of Christ to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as Peter instructs us to do at 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. And hopefully we are doing that even this very hour. That as we come together, but not just in this setting, but all throughout the week, we can have discussions with each other about Scripture. We can encourage one another. We can help each other to see maybe the abilities and talents that God has given to us that maybe we don't see ourselves and help each other to grow to be more like Jesus. There have been, and every week, there are a number of our own who are sick. And I know that very well in my family that has just seems like just keeps passing sickness on to uh, one and the other. But we can care for the sick. We have had a number of opportunities, as we mentioned in our adult class in the back this morning, because of the tornadoes that have come through here in recent weeks. We have had an opportunity to serve others. Some of us, I know, have been involved in helping clean up all of the mess that the tornado left uh, to people in neighborhoods, people we don't even know. And we have had the opportunity to uh, show this attitude, this heart of service to one another in the body of Christ, uh, maybe to offer, as I know, even for my family, when we were only uh, without power for about 23 hours, I think. Uh, But I know that there were others here who offered and did open up their homes to those who had lost power, to those who needed a place to to stay, a hot meal, a hot shower, 
and those kinds of things, to certainly give of the gift of money that God has given to us if we have been blessed in that way, to people who are in need, to our brothers or sisters or just people that we don't know, to send encouraging texts and cards and emails to one another. Because my family, there has been, I think, at least one person in my family that's been sick for the last six or seven weeks with a few uh, short days in between where all of us were well. There have been several of you that have sent cards to us and have sent cards to our children. <laughs> and that's impressive to me. When you're thinking about children, you're, you're thinking like Jesus, I do. Just to encourage and to build each other up. The, the list of the ways we can be like Jesus, that Jesus can make us a servant like himself, is just endless. And you might be thinking, as I know some in the audience are getting older in life, and maybe their mind wants to do all these things that they did when they were younger, but their body just won't let them. And you think, well, I can't go move trees, and I, I can't uh, fix a, a big elaborate meal for a family, and I can't do this or that. But th there are things that you can do. There are things that older Christians can do. Don't sell yourself short if all you can do, and I say all you can do as we think about it, is to give money or funds or to go buy food for someone. Remember again, just a cup of cold water given in his name. Jesus takes notice of that and he will reward us for that one day. We sing a song, Make Me a Servant, a servant song. And I want to close this morning by just reading the words of that particular song. It's song number 591. And it's like a lot of songs. I think it's very easy for us to sing. And the words just roll off our lips and we're really not maybe thinking about all the implications of what we're saying. But here ought to be, here should be our prayer. Here should be our true desire if we are Christians. The song says, Make me a servant just like your son, for he was a servant. Please make me one. Make me a servant, do what you must do to make me a servant. Make me like you. Make me a servant, take all my pride, for I will be lowly, humble inside, giving to others with all that I do in love for my brother. Make me like you. Make me a servant filled with your might, and may all my labors shine with your light. Show me your footsteps and what I should do. For now and forever, make me like you. Probably, again, a lot of us have sung that song many times. But I hope the next time we sing that song, those words will really be impactful for us. Jesus came to earth to serve you and me. And yes, this is a great act of service, a great example of service that he shows us here in John 13 of washing the disciples' feet. But as we've already looked at this morning, the greatest example of his service is by laying down his life on the cross so that we could die to sin and we could live to righteousness and live for him. What about you this morning? Would you take advantage of what Jesus has done for you? Come before this audience confessing your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and turning away from your sins and giving yourself fully to him. And he will make you a servant and then being buried in the waters of baptism, and you can devote the rest of your life to being just like Jesus in this regard. Whatever your need might be, if we can help you, if you need to respond to the invitation of our Lord, do that now as we stand and as we sing.